thank you very much for the invitation. I want to thank Susan for inviting me to give a colloquium and also want to thank Susan for amazing hospitality. It's really wonderful to be in person to see everybody. It's just I, I'm realizing how much I how much uh, how much I miss that and I'm still missing it. So I will talk about two generalizations of the Boltzmann equation. Okay, this mouse is working so far. Great. So it's based on joint works with your um, First part of the talk is related to joint works with Joachim Ampatsovo. He was my student, now he's postdoc at NYU. And the uh, uh, second part of the talk is related to joint work with both Joachim Ampatsovo and John Miller, who is currently a student at UT. So, um, this, sorry, let me see if we can move. Yes. Um, so, let me, the first, I'll tell a little bit about what the talk is about. So, it is that you realize that it's not your cup of tea and you want to think about something else, I hope that at least you will remember the first two slides, which Igor, I think, already shared with us. And uh, then I'll recall Boltzmann equation and we will talk about the interactions in Boltzmann equation that go beyond binary interactions. So that's one of these two tales of generalizations. And the other one is how to think about mixtures of gases. Okay, so okay. okay. So here's what is the talk about in general. So it's really about trying to find connections between systems of huge numbers of particles, finite number of particles, but huge. Think about like 10 to the 30, which is relevant when one studies various stars, okay? And you do not care what each particle is doing on their own, but you're trying to figure out if there is a collective behavior in the system. So then almost counterintuitively, except for mathematicians, am I right? We tend to look at the limit as number of particles goes to infinity. And the point of doing that is this system when number of particles goes to infinity often formally admits a special solution, which is based on factorization. And that one factor is governed by not linear partial differential equation. So systems here are linear and coupled, systems here are linear and coupled systems of PDE. You get to non-linear PDE that, behave, that describes behavior of one particle. It could be waves like Schrodinger equation, or it could be behavior of a gas like in kinetic systems, okay? So it's really about going back and forth in this, in this picture. So then perhaps the first natural question is why would you want to do that? Okay, and uh, uh, so let me illustrate by an example. And this is the case of, there are many examples in um, various fields, but one in physics and in math is bosons and condensation. So in case, when you start with the system of interacting bosons, what one of derives is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So behavior of one particle is described with a, one wave is, is described with a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And uh, this, communal behavior of the system is uh, intimately related with bosons and condensation, okay? Which of course, as we know, is pred was predicted in 1920s by Bose and Einstein. It was experimentally uh, demonstrated only in 1995, a long time after, and that motivated mathematicians to try to prove it. Here is um, actually a picture that I like a lot. It, there's no math in the picture, am I right? But it's about this collective behavior. It's artist conception of bosons and condensation. It was on the cover of Science Magazine in 95 after these crucial experiments in the University of Colorado at Boulder and at MIT. Okay. So uh, this is what the, what the spirit of the talk. We will be in the kinetic world for this talk. So first I will review a little bit about Boltzmann equation, binary Boltzmann equation, regular in order to tell you what we have been playing with beyond Boltzmann. So here is the equation. So delta T, uh, so the equation was introduced by Maxwell and, Bol and Boltzmann in the late 1860s, early 1870s. So what we have here, X stands for the position in RD in general, the most relevant in three dimensions, time T, velocity V. And F describes the evolution of the density of the gas at position X time T velocity V, density of gas particles. And what we see on the left-hand side is transport equation, am I right, for this density F? On the right-hand side is Q2, which is collisional operator. So that's quadratic integral operator that expresses change of F due to binary collisions. And the, the exact form of Q2 depends on type of collisions. So let me show, let me tell you a little bit more about Q2. Okay. 
So here we have some pictures. So if V1, V prime and V1 prime, we denote by them the pre-collisional velocities. So then one can form their difference. This is the relative pre-collisional vector. So after the collision, we will denote velocities of these two particles by V and V1. Those are post-collisional velocities. So one can still form their difference and one can form the relative uh, post-collisional vector. I'm reviewing this in order to give a one of the possible formulas for the kernel, for the collisional operator Q. So then what really matters are unit vectors in these two directions, in the direction of U prime and U. So I think that's exactly what's happening on my next picture. Sigma is the unit vector in the direction of relative pre-collisional velocity. U hat is unit vector in the direction of uh, uh, relative post-collisional velocity and this angle theta. Okay, so if one assumes that we talk about elastic interactions, then there is a conservation of momentum, which is the sum of the velocities before and after collision are the same, and also conservation of energy. So then one can actually calculate pre-collisional velocities, V prime and V1 prime, in terms of post-collisional velocities. You can get rid of, thanks to the conservation law, you can get rid of here, temporarily at least, the prime variables, you can express them, but you are left with this parameter sigma, which is the, uh, which is the, which belongs to S D minus one. Okay. So then Q can be written in the following way. I'm still hi hiding a little bit things. So um, let me actually try. Maybe, ah, oh, it works. Yeah. So Q2 here, we have the formula. So what's happening, we are integrating that sigma and we are integrating V1. So what we are left is evaluated at position, time, and velocity. It's quadratic in, in its nature. Those are pre-collisional densities. Those are post-collisional densities. And then there is still kernel. Okay, so kernel depends on the cosine, kernel depends on the absolute value of u and the co on that angle between u hat and sigma. Okay, so here we are. So I'm writing here some possibility for the kernel B as usually power function of the absolute value of u and the cosine of the angle. So then people distinguish types of Boltzmann equation depending on that kernel. So when A is between zero and one, less than or equal than one, this is so-called variable heart potential. The case that you uh, that people are typically very uh, familiar with is the case when A is one. So those are hard spheres, okay? Then there is a case when A is zero, so there is no power. And as you can imagine, that's called Maxwell molecules. That's the case actually when certain algebraic things occur that one can observe in that case and algebra is helping solve various issues there. And then there is a case when A is negative from minus D to zero, that's soft potential case. So then it's actually extra complicated because there's extra singularity living in the kernel, okay? So, I will not be talking about Boltzmann equation itself because people study, of course, Valpozness and there are many open questions. Uh, there are toy models that people look at, like not toy, but easier models such as homogeneous case where people understand better what's going on. I'll not be talking about that. I would, li I would like to understand what's happening if we go beyond binary collisions, okay? So this is work with Joachim Ampatsoglu. So let me first try to address why I would one to want to do that and what's the direction where we are going, okay? So the Boltzmann equation itself takes into account collisions, binary collisions of particles, and ternary or higher order collisions are neglected due to lower probability of happening. And one actually, when one derives Boltzmann equation, one can actually formulate this mathematically that there is probability of higher order collision disappears in part due to like having a microscope and the lens. You're putting a lens in a way that your lens is observing just binary interactions. So all other interactions are not visible. Okay. However, when the gas is dense enough, higher interactions matter. One example is colloid, which is a substance which have ultra microscop microscopic particles of one substance inside the other. So think of, for example, gel or foam or milk. Okay. So in situ, those are just some examples. It, it was pointed out by some phys by physicists around 2002. There were a few teams that said that multi interactions among particles significantly matter in such cases. And they thought that it's appropriate in that case to look at the grand potential of a colloidal gas, which is modeled by some of higher order interactions, okay? 
So this is not exactly what we are modeling. I'm just saying this is in part inspiration, okay? So motivated by, motivated by what I just said, we aim to introduce and then rigorously derive equation that looks like 3.1. So this can be thought of as a toy model for the non-ideal gas. So what's the equation? On the left-hand side, it's a transport of the density F, delta T F plus V dot gradient X F. On the right-hand side, we allow, we allow for the sum of Q Ks. So QK is the key to order collisional operator. So we know what Q2 is, I just discussed. So imagine having Q3 and so on. And then you do the sum K going from two to M, where M is the order of highest order collision that's allowed. So this corresponds a little bit to this, what this paper said about uh, obtaining higher, sum of higher order collisions. Um, it turns out after we uh, had a preprint video came on this work and we chatted with Irene, you know, my colleague Irene Gamba, it turns out that actually Bodila Gamba and Cercignani had a sequence of papers where they studied well poseness of uh, problems like that using the Fourier transform methods of the nonlinear PDE. And in those papers, they were talking about potential uh, applications in economics. So what we care about is actually deriving the system of equations, okay? So the task of rigorously deriving equation, even when the case when M is two, when we are talking about binary, when we say deriving, what we mean by that is going from N particle system and which you look at Newton's law of motion there, and then you look at the rigorously limit as N goes to infinity, you get binary Boltzmann equation. Even that is hard problem, at least to do it for long times. So Hilbert described this in his famous as in, in his famous sixth problem as one of the main challenges for the mathematicians of the 20th century. It's actually he's still entertaining and it's a problem that, that challenges some of us in the 21st century. So in the case when M is equal to two, the analysis was pioneered in 75 by Lanford, and this was recently revisited and completed by Gallagher, Sandermon, and Texier. And there are some other papers. This influential one is from 2012. Also also, for when you look at short range potential, uh, the analysis there were people were working, it started by King. I think my understanding was that King was student of Lanford at the time, and then revisited by people in the same group, Gallagher, Sandermont, Texier, but also Pulvira and Pisapirio Simonella. Long range potentials, many open questions there. Okay. So, and also long times, this is done for short times which is related to where people can prove existence of Boltzmann equation in certain cases. Again, going beyond time of the first collision, it's uh, fairly unknown. So there are many open questions related to M is equal to case. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? Now, uh, up to our knowledge, the case M is equal to three, which means having binary, remember the sum, okay, going from two to M, having binary and ternary term is pretty open. So this one, uh, uh, requires, in, a, in addition to understanding binary interactions and ternary on their own, one needs to understand their mutual interactions. So I'll tell you a little bit about that work that we did with Joaquin, but before that, I will focus on the equation with Q3 only, which we did really as a toy model in order to understand the difficulties and challenges of Q3. So once we understood that, then we were ready to look at Q2 and Q3 together. So um, I'll tell you now about derivation of ternary Boltzmann equation. So the equation that has on the right hand side just Q3. Think about it as a toy mod. Okay. So uh, I'm structuring this this kind of like talk in terms of challenges that we faced, and then what did we do to address them? Okay. So first challenge was how to make sense of ternary interactions so that they so that we can detect their contributions. So this is related to this microscope, microscope analogy from a few minutes ago. If we look at the scaling limit that people use to this to look at to derive binary Boltzmann equation, of course, we are not going to obtain ternary because ternary will be error there and it will disappear in the limit. So we need to change the we need to change the lens on that microscope. How do we do that sensibly so that it's physically relevant? Okay. So in a typical dilute hard sphere gas, the first point here is that probability of simultaneous contact of three hard spheres that all two of each two attaching is less than situation when one of them is in simultaneous contact with the other two. 
That's just one simple observation. Okay. The other observation that comes from this physics paper is that interactions among three particles are determined by the sum of the distances of interacting particles. So this is very relevant to us. We are deciding to model following this distance protocol in some sense. Alternatively, as you know, there are different problems in physics that are very hard, complete, very much unknown, which is three-body problem where people look at various combinatorial things and various geometric uh, contexts behind. We are not doing that. So we are saying we will look at the distances between particles. So motivated by these two uh, points, one and two, here we give a definition of what we call interaction, or you can call it collision, but that's a little bit stretching that word because they don't necessarily have to touch, they just have to be close by. So let's absolutely be positive. I consider three particles here, I'm calling them i, j, k, and their positions and velocities are denoted by x, i, v, i, x, j, v, j, x, k, v, k. So we say that these three particles are in I, J, K, Taylor interaction, not the semicolon here. If the following happens, if the square of the distance, which we defined like that, is a function of epsilon. Uh, this is the square sum of the, uh, this uh, distance squared is sum of the square of the distances between Xi and Xj and Xi and Xk. So for us, for things related to modeling, it was easier to do this asymmetric situation first. The i to one is special because we are measuring the distance from i to j and from i to k. Okay, I will tell you later, we can actually remove uh, the, um, uh, there's a way how we can, one can remove that assumption. Okay. So this is called, epsilon is called the interaction zone. So this is what we mean by Taylor interaction. So here I'm just saying about distances between positions of particles, but now you, you will be, next step is if there is a collision of that type, you want to understand how pre-collisional velocities move into post-collisional velocities. So we need to have a linear transformation that moves pre-collisional uh, velocities into post-collisional velocities, velocities. How do we obtain that? Okay, so consider, here's a little actual calculation of that, consider Taylor interaction i, j, k. So that means that 3.3 is satisfied. The sum of the square of the distance is, is two epsilon squared. So then denote by v, j star, v, k star, and sorry, v, i star, v, j star, v, k star, velocities after the interaction. And assume that it's elastic interaction, that there is conservation of momentum and energy. Here's conservation of the momentum. So post-collisional velocity, sum of them is equal to sum of the pre-collisional velocities, and also energy before the collision is equal to energy after the collision. So then how do we solve for the stars? We need to basically solve that system. If you do a little algebra exercise, there are too many variables and, too, and not enough equations there to have unique solutions. You have to think how to do it. Okay, so let me tell you what we did and what turned out to be generalization of what people do in the binary case. So let's revisit the, the law for the collision here. The distance is equal to epsilon squared. So if you introduce the vectors omega one, which is the distance in time t between positions and you divide it by this coefficient and the omega two, the one between k and i, well, this one is i and j. So then uh, what's happening is that 3.3 is the same as saying, when we introduce these objects omega one and omega two, we call them impact directions. So then you see that the vector omega one, omega two lives in a higher dimensional sphere. Okay, so this is in S two D minus one. So this is extra condition that's equivalent basically to 3.3. Not the extra condition, this is just a remark here. The extra condition, so this is what I was saying, you have you want to get unique solution for that system. So how do we how do we know that there is unique solution? That's the first question. So we impose extra condition. And this is the condition that we impose that post-collisional velocity in the direction of Vj is really like obtained from Vj itself minus C omega one for some constant C. And also for the post-collisional velocity K, we require Vk with the same constant C omega two. And this is actually having this condition, the previous system can be uniquely solved. And you can wonder like, is it natural to have such a condition? So actually, if you forget in this vector, the second line, this is exactly the condition that Lanford and Douders and Mon and Texier had in the case of binary, okay? So therefore there is a linear transformation that maps 
pre-collisional velocities into post-collisional velocities if we have interaction law as we introduced. And we are going to, when that happens, we are going to denote this uh, the resulting velocities in stars. Okay. So um, this is still preparation for looking at the limit. So uh, how do we do the limit? So we are motivated, so in, this is guided by the framework that Lanford introduced, but again, model of the challenges that we face. So first we need to introduce the phase space. So in dimension and the, uh, so what we do is uh, we introduce the set 3.9. So that set of all configurations Zn, which include the vector of all positions and vector of all velocities for the n particles. So here this is just a vector going x1 to xn, and Vn is the vector of velocities, such that where it's really the framework where everything is happening, and that's that our concept of distance is greater than or equal than two epsilon squared. Either particles are far away, they're not colliding, or when they are, when this distance is exactly equal to two epsilon squared, that means there's interaction of the three particles. So that's the phase space, okay? And we do the counting by keeping track of the particles by requiring that i, j, k are in the set i, n, where these are ordered, that i is more than j is more than k, okay? So that's in order to count. So uh, now, how does this system evolve? So this is what I said, when they are far away, they are moving linearly. So this is the first equation. Particles perform rectilinear motion as long as there is no interaction. In other words, x dot is v, v dot is zero, no interaction, okay? For all of the i part, i going from one to n. Now, what happens if they interact in the primary sense? Imagine, assume that initial configuration, this is initially at time zero, x n v n has involved until time t to something that looks like x n of t v n of t, and assume that there is i j k interaction at time t, that we prescribe that the velocities, velocities v i v j v k will change into the stars, while all the others velocities will be left unchanged. Okay, so this is really dynamical system. When there are no collisions, it's rectilinear motion. When there are collisions, this is happening with velocities. So our next challenge is to study that dynamical system. Okay, so still at the end particle level. Okay, so challenge number two, it's not obvious that this dynamical system that I described in the previous slide um, is uh, producing a well-defined dynamics. Yes. Um, so can you go back to chapter two? Uh-huh. Yes. Um, in the second part, second bullet point, you say there is an IJK interaction at time. Yes. You mean epsilon IJK interaction? Yes, I mean okay. epsilon, absolutely. So when I, in, during this part of the talk, I always mean epsilon. Yeah. So uh, what we need to prove is that this is globally well-defined, okay, for n particles. So this is actually brings us back to PhD thesis of Alexandra in 1975, who established global well-defined well, uh, well dynamics for the case of the binary interactions, okay? So we could not apply Alexander because it was not written for possibility of binary interactions. So we had to study to figure out how to do that. And we managed that. We proved that there is a global in time measure preserving flow uh, defined for our almost all initial configurations. And the crucial point is what I put here in the second point is that why we can succeed to go from local to global dynamics in time is that if a triplet of of, uh, uh, particles was in interaction, then for the subsequent interaction, you cannot have involvement of the same particles, okay? So in other words, if a triplet of particles was in interaction, then as the system evolves in time, subsequent interaction cannot involve the same triplet of particles. It can involve some of them, but not all three of them. One can prove that, okay? So all this to finally obtain Liouville equation. So the global thing, this gives us the global measure preserving interaction flow yields to Liouville equation that looks as follows. By the way, if you're familiar with the derivation of the Schrodinger equation, one starts with the dynamical systems and put the Hamiltonian there for the n particles, and then does various machineries like doing marginals of the NBB, JKY, and so on. But there you start immediately, you have Hamiltonian and the system, and that's where you start. Here we had to work all the way. Liouville equation is analog of having Hamiltonian uh, system and linear Schrodinger equation. So here you, you do have to do all this work to get to the starting point, okay? 
So here is the label equation. It's really like transport is uh, so transport uh, in the interior of the phase space and on the boundary of the phase space velocity switch. Okay, those that of interacting particles. Okay, so. Um, integrating by parts so then after that we uh, go we look at the limit uh, from that level equation how do we take the limit as n goes to infinity so we um, we actually do we, inter, we apply a concept of a marginal we integrate out certain variables thanks to symmetry and we obtain a system of finite system of, uh, of uh, pdes which are called pbgky hierarchy which is the system satisfied by marginals i didn't want to put that on the slide because there's no need to look at that formula and uh, uh, of course one needs to derive it and then one looks at formally the limit as n goes to infinity to figure out what's going to happen in that limit. So first we obtain a different scaling in order to carry the limit. So our scaling is n epsilon to the d minus one half rather than n epsilon to the d minus one, which was in the binary case. So of course we have a different scaling because this is this game with the microscope and lens, okay? And what we obtain, we obtain infinite system of equations, which I'm not writing here, uh, but that infinite system admits a special solution, which is factorized where one factor solves what we call ternary Boltzmann equation. So it's delta Tf plus V dot gradient Xf Q3. And I want to show you formula Q3. Q3 is somehow what's happening, the result of the collision of ternary collisions in the limit as number of particles goes to infinity. By the way, in the binary case, this analog of this limit is called Boltzmann grad limit. So here, this is different type of thing. Okay. So Q3 is, there are various things on this slide that I don't want to focus on. I would rather want to say that there is, so it's hard, it corresponds to hard sphere in the sense, so that's decoded in this V and the inner product. But of course, with, because there are two directions, impact directions, omega one and omega two, we need to take into account both of them. Because in the case of the binary, there, oh, sorry, how did I, uh, I moved. Okay, in the case of the binary, uh, kernel does not have this part, it has only this part. Okay, and it's ternary in the sense that there are product of three Fs here, except that they are not quite product because it's not the same F cubed. That's what challenge and interesting thing about this equation, but rather F at different velocities. Okay. Okay, and now challenge number three in this case is um, proving convergence of the BBGKY hierarchy to the infinite Boltzmann hierarchy. And this is really where the hard technical part lies. So one needs to identify so-called good configurations. So configuration is good that do not run into any kind of interactions on the backwards in time evolution, okay? So, and then once we identify these good configurations, we need to study their stability. The situation is very different than the binary. So we had to, uh, we had to somehow figure out the uh, tools in order to address that. So there's a lot of, I'm not going to do pictures or anything here, but there was a lot of new geometric estimates that uh, various interesting sets and the intersections of those sets, you need to calculate them algebraically, the formulas for them. So just sort of two creatures that appear as spherical estimates where you intersect sphere of that type with a um, uh, cylinder times RD, solid cylinder, and uh, also there are certain ellipsoidal estimates uh, of the intersection of ellipsoids with cylinder times RT. So ellipsoids here is natural because of these two impact directions, omega one and omega two. So I'm not going to show details. I wanted to just have big picture here. Okay. So what I want to discuss next is, you remember, you might uh, just comment, you remember we require that i is smaller than j is smaller than k, and uh, that's, that's one requirement, but from the very beginning, we required that there is a notion of a central particle in the interaction. So when we talked about i, j, k, we, I was special because I interact with j and I interact with k. So one question is, can we get rid of that special role of i? 
and we can actually we have a we described the way in the paper we described the way how to do it now we're actually carrying it out we didn't do it because technically it was easier for us to do asymmetric ones but subsequently now we are studying the nonlinear equation in various ways and i will tell you a little bit about that and the physically relevant is one which is symmetrized Okay, so the point of uh, we can indeed symmetrize interaction. And here, unfortunately, I was changing uh, location yesterday in the last moment. So the line second and third, like these two formulas, don't use the same notation. And in here, L has the same role as pi per notation here. The point is IJK is interaction, but you also introduce, uh, you inter introduce L or it, here it's actually you introduce pi, which is permutation of IJK. So then you run over the all permutation. So in other words, you introduce the set such that not only that you care about IJK between the regular interaction, but you permute all possibilities. So you symmetrize the equation. And uh, you can then carry the entire program with the symmetrized, and the final result will be Q3, which is symmetrized. And it's relevant because it's physically relevant because for the symmetrized, you can show that it's the same steady state as for the binary Boltzmann equation, which is Max Maxwellian, and you can prove very sudden nice properties of the symmetrized equation. Okay. So what we wanted to do next is derive really binary ternary equation because we thought like ternary should be some sort of higher order uh, correction in this equation. Okay, so we would like to understand derivation. We, uh, with your king, we pursue derivation of the equation that has Q2 and Q3, okay, which we call binary ternary. And let me tell you some obstacles that immediately we were faced with immediately that were really cool. I, 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 for a moment, we thought we were stuck. But then we figured out how to deal with that. Okay, sorry, here it is. Um, the first challenge is detecting both binary and ternary interactions at the same time. Going back to the lens, you remember one lens to see binary, another set of lens to get ternary. How do you see both of them? How do you detect both of them? So the issue is binary Boltzmann deals of, uh, is obtained from the binary interactions, which are defined in terms of the binary distance between particles being equal to epsilon. Okay. Ternary interaction is this ternary concept of ternary distance is equal to another function of epsilon. How can you at the same time afford both of them? So you might say, okay, why? What's the problem? So the problem is that the binary one imposes the scaling 3.15. And epsilon to the d minus one is equal to one. Ternary imposes different scaling. So you cannot at the same time survive with both of these scalings. So the way how we go about that is the following. We actually say it doesn't have to be the same epsilon. It should be just two different epsilons, epsilon two and epsilon three. So what we do is we overcome this by saying particles are hard spheres of diameter epsilon two. So here is what we mean the particle. So this is epsilon two, all right? But then we still can talk about, uh, uh, so let's call this I, and this is J, and this is K. I can sum them up and I can do the distance between I and J plus the distance between I and, so it's actually the square distances is equal some function of epsilon three, okay? So I can talk about, so, Epsilon two is the relevant when we do uh, binary interactions. And then we talk about epsilon three, which is describing ternary interactions. So particles are hard spheres of diameter epsilon two. They can interact as hard spheres just by touching and reflecting, am I right? But also we allow them to at the same time interact as ternary interactions. But we can do that if we assume that epsilon two, we put both scalings binary scaling with respect to epsilon two, ternary with respect to epsilon three. This implies that epsilon two is much smaller than epsilon three, which is actually natural according to the picture. You have like marbles and they can binary uh, 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 collide, am I right? But also you can look at higher clusters of them that they have to be of bigger interactions on, okay? But then we don't have binary interactions at epsilon three. Uh, so that's a good question. That's my next slide. Okay. So then you. Uh, so then the question is. So this is how do you. Uh, how do you allow yourself to detect both? 
that. Okay. Then the next question, as as Yudang is uh, uh, mentioning here, is the coupling. So uh, do you allow? So a priori, a priori, our framework allows that you have particle I and J interacting as hard spheres. So here I have picture they interacting at the hard sphere. While at the same time there is another. So as I said, I actually I did that on this picture here. So they can interact binary, they can interact ternary, but the question is, is it really possible to have a situation of that type that they interact binary and at the same time there is a particle where they interact as a ternary? So the problem, like first you ask like, what's the problem with this case? What would be the problem? So the problem is if you have a monster like that, you do not know if it's responsible for creating Q2 or if it's responsible for creating Q3 or somehow some linear combination of those two. So the good news is that you have to assume that this thing happens, okay, among all other pathological situations. And then you show that probability of this happening is low. So in the limit, as number of particles goes to infinity, it disappears. So what we actually show is, and this is in the proof, um, that uh, the only type we show that as long as epsilon 2 is more than epsilon 3 and they're squeezed between 0 and 1, only the following two interaction scenarios happen. The first picture shows pure binary. So pure binary is two particles interacting as hard spheres. So this is I and J, while all other particles are not involved in any binary or ternary interaction at the same time. So for this lambda two, so if these are interacting here, then what, what I'm saying here is that then, then there's no ternary interaction with respect to K. There's this K particle, but this lambda two is bigger than epsilon two. So if, Binary happens, there is no other ternary involving this two. And also when purely ternary interaction happens like this, what we actually show is that then there is no binary interaction involving any of any, any couple from those three particles. Okay. But this is not a priori always possible. There's an entire combinatorial uh, situation in front of us. And then we slowly in the proof, we are showing that the probabilities of various scenarios are small. So what survives are only these two, which is good news because this is responsible for creating Q2 in the limit, and this is responsible for creating Q3, okay? And, uh, um, okay. So non-trivial probability doesn't mean zero probability. It's not zero at any certain, uh, point, any finite. So the point is we really care about the limit as number of particles goes to infinity and epsilon two goes to zero, epsilon three goes to zero. So you calculate these probabilities in terms of n, epsilon two and epsilon three and various other parameters. And then in the limit, it goes to zero, exactly. Otherwise we cannot, yeah. So then most work actually happens by doing the convergence. So convergence introduces very, uh, various new scenarios. So I here pointed out just one of them and how are we doing the time? Okay, so assume that we have good configuration of M particles and we add now then this, in that you have a train of M particles and you can add two uh, sigma particles into that system. So sigma can be either one, one new particle is coming because that would mean binary interaction between the new one and one of the those wagons in the train, or it could be that two of them are coming and it could be ternary interaction, okay? So um, on the backwards time involution, so, uh, the system could run, one of the scenarios that we deal with is the following. Imagine those um, N particles that are already there and one of them is the I. And there are two new particles coming here. I'm calling them M plus one and M plus two. And imagine that you have a situation where they are interacting ternary. So particle I, particle M plus one, and M plus two are interacting. So then one situation that we face that backwards in time, this uh, could run into purely binary interaction. So this is one of the cases that was not studied before. When, we, when people did binary, this picture was binary, binary. When people did, we did ternary, this picture was ternary, ternary. So now we have two new situations. Ternary, binary, binary, ternary. One of them can be easily handled by scaling because scaling works in the situation that you get rid of one of them. But for the other one, you really have to dig in. And when we dig in, it requires new geometric estimates. So that's, I think, all what I wanted to say in terms of technical things uh, about the proof. Um, 
what I want to tell you now is uh, what we are doing about the equation. At least one of the works that we are doing is about the equation. So we started to study the equation and we did Enegam, Joachim Abotzog and Maya Taskovic. We started to play a little bit to understand better like what is this binary ternary equation? How different is it from Boltzmann equation itself? So the, there is a paper that we have uh, where we study global well poisonous for small data using the so-called canal schimbrot method. And I don't want to tell you about that because that one, that's, uh, I'm happy with what we did uh, there. So the, uh, and in some sense, we were able to show that what one obtains for Boltzmann equation itself, one can obtain for binary ternary, which means that really we are talking, we are on a good, it's intuitively telling us that we are on a good track, that this is all really higher order correction. But what I was hoping, dreaming about is that this binary ternary equation will may be able to tell us more than just binary or just ternary. And this was just a more like hope and the best case scenario. And I'm super happy to tell you that there is a situation where we're observing that. We all were a little bit surprised. Now, of course, when we, when we got it and realized it makes sense, we should have realized this immediately, but there is, there is a, because it's like a new equation, you ask yourself, well, what's the point? Like, is it higher order correction or there is something new? So this is this work one that I want to mention that it's about to be on archive this week, next week, something like that. Um, Generation, so we are talking about uh, uh, density of a gas, so it's natural to look at moments, higher order moments. And one, look, one can look at moments that are polynomial functions of velocity, or one can look at moments that are exponential function of velocity. Because just by summing polynomial moments, that's of course a representation for the exponential function. So exponential moments are natural object to study in the case of Boltzmann equation. So with uh, Joachim Ampetsoglu, Irene Gamba, and Maya Taskovic, we are finishing right now the paper where we show that coexistence of binary and ternary collisions yields actually better generation of moments in time properties than when only binary or ternary equation are considered. So generation of moments results are typically results you start with just having some finite energy, assumption of the finite energy, and then you show that at any later time, all higher order moments are finite. So that's why it's they're generated in time, because you do not assume that originally you start there. That's why it's called generation, as opposed to propagation, where you start with assumption initially and you show that it propagates in time. So when we look at exponential moments for the binary ternary equation, we, um, we, we, when we do techniques for that equation there, we actually see that having binary and ternary helps, and we can obtain results that you cannot obtain if you have just binary or just ternary. So specifically, one case where it helps is for maximum molecules, people didn't know for the binary equation, for the maximum molecules, people didn't know uh, much about generation of exponential moments in time. And what we can do by you, when you add a ternary, you can actually look at that question and show generation of uh, uh, exponential moments. So what this, is the mechanism for that? Sorry? What is the mechanism for that? What is the mechanism? That's a good, uh, excellent question. So mechanism for that is you obtain. So first you know, know, need to look at some velocity averaging estimates. You study the kernel in a certain way and you obtain its properties. And then you use that in order to obtain. So you study moments. And what you obtain is you want to obtain moment inequality, which are some ODEs. And then you want to conclude from the moment inequalities. So the mechanism is because in the moment inequality, which is look like M prime on the left for polynomial moment, on the right hand side, you have something, you get the moment or the E, okay, which is coupled system of moment equations. And uh, usually you would have just one term on the right hand side with a negative sign coming as a consequence of the collisional operation. Now with having binary and ternary, we actually do have, we have two terms with a negative side on the right hand side. So we can take the better one of the two. So having the two, having the linear combination in the moment inequalities transfers to having on the right hand side stuff with the negative sign with the inequalities and gives you uh, freedom to choose whatever is better number. Okay, so basically the binary and ternary are both like a preferable terms and you have a combination of both. Yes, you have, having the combination of both is what helps, having the linear combination. Which, of course, then imagine that if you have a linear combination of finite, if we go all the way up to M, then it's even better. Yeah. So it's really, it's, it's, there is some evidence there that it's a higher order correction and it helps in certain instances, but not in all, in certain. 
Uh, another piece of work that we um, uh, hopefully will, will finish soon. So this is with um, uh, Esteban Cardenas, who is a student of my colleague Thomas Chan, and with Billy Barner, who's a student of, who works with me at UT Austin. So we, uh, we were curious, like, what happens if you play with stochastic processes and you think about ternary stochastic process a higher order all the way to M, uh, which is which goes back to the work of cuts. So what we, uh, what we generalize Katz's original many particle binary stochastic model to derive a space homogeneous Boltzmann equation. So Katz's model allowed only binary interactions in this uh, in the stochastic model. We allow, we allow actually any k order interaction and we do the sum from M, weighted sum from two to n high order interactions. So what I'm going to say for the homogeneous derivation of the homogeneous equation in the case of Maxwell molecules, this is related to the work of cuts for binary. So we can think about that now in terms of the higher order uh, generalizations. Okay. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Um, well, you started a little late. So I'd say you have uh, at least five minutes, five to 10 okay. minutes. Okay, thank you. So I can use that to tell a little bit about it because there were two tales of generalization. So the first one was really binary ternary. The second one is different topic about mixtures of gases. So this is joint work with Joachim Ampatsopo and John Miller. Okay. So here's the picture. So much effort has been put into studying, as we know, the mixtures of gases. So here it's relevant. So here we have red and blue particles. Gas mixtures such as helium and xenon were studied as possible coolants in nuclear reactors. And also sound propagation in binary mixtures has been studied. So there are many uh, instances in physics where mixtures of gases or chemistry are relevant. We are talking here about binary only, but mixture, two types of gases. Okay. So what's the system that governs that uh, such a gas? So here uh, I'm illustrating in case of two gases. So consider one type of gas A and the other type B. So G naught here stands for the initial density distribution for the gas A. And H naught stands for the initial uh, distribution for the gas type B. So what is the nonlinear PDE that one should hope to obtain? Of course, it's related to Boltzmann equation, there are gases and binary collisions. So what one obtains is system of Boltzmann equation in that case. So for the gas A, you have a transport here, delta Tg plus V dot gradient G, and there is a term that, that's related to binary collisions, Gg, but then uh, also the term that's related to the but one gas of type A is colliding with a particle from gas of type B. So this is this GH, okay? And similarly for H, you have the term with HH and then you have a mixture. So this system of Boltzmann equation has been studied for a long time. Originally, first formulations go to 1950s, but it has been uh, alive. It, 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 uh, there was a uh, people recently revisited and obtained some interesting new results, uh, like propagation of moments. And people around my colleague Irene Gamba and her team have been studying this question a lot: system of Boltzmann equations. So we wondered. Uh, it's actually one of the talks that I went. Uh, a candidate, it was a candidacy talk, and we wondered, like, but how do you obtain them? What's the starting system? Like, what's happening? So we are very happy to answer that question. We, um, so this five mathematical progress on the subject of understanding behavioral systems, no work has been done on rigorously deriving that system from any particle systems. So we address that by deriving the Boltzmann system for a mixture of finitely many hard spheres. And this is with Joachim and Joel together. And this is really like, I, thought, I was puzzled, like, what do you start with? Do you start with the system and you obtain that? Or do you start with just one equation, one probability distribution of all these particles and see what's happening? So it turns out, of course, you start with one probability distribution of everything that's in front of you, and then you have to figure out how to keep track of separating them and what happens to that. Okay. So, um, so we consider a system of, we actually in the paper consider finitely many different gases, but for the sake of presentation, I'll just mention two. And Joe did some really interesting work on how to combinatorially really write elegantly everything for not just two gases, but certain number of gases, okay? So imagine that you have N1 hard spheres of mass, M1 and diameter epsilon one, and imagine that they are mixed with N2 hard spheres of mass M2 and diameter epsilon two. So then you denote for the i particle the center by Xi and Vi for the first type of gas, 
And for the second one, just for the sake of the slides, I will use yi for the center and uh, velocity I will denote by wi. Okay, so we have axes and v's. So axes and v's are positions and velocity for the part gas A, and these are particles of gas B, positions and velocities. So then the phase space is, is set of all initial con configurations that sorry, is that N1, N2, such that uh, uh, you have a possibility of particles from the same type A interacting, absolute value of xi minus xj is greater or equal than epsilon one. Particles from gas B can interact, those are two y's, or the particles from gas A and B can interact. So this is the combination axes and y's. Okay, everything binded. Okay. So, um, so then what is, how do you get to the Liouville equation? So the dynamics is governed by the, these two here uh, points. Number one is if no collisions, we assume that the particles perform rectilinear motion. So this is gas A, they're moving linearly, okay, no collisions. And this is gas B, they're moving linearly, no collisions, okay? And then when collision happens, we assume that they're in the elastic situation, so conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. So then you have four possibilities which type of collision happens. And here I wrote just one of them. You say that when they collide, here when particle from gas A and particle of from gas B collide, which means that their distance is exactly this number. So then you, you calculate what the post-collisional velocities should be based on pre-collisional velocities, heavy conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Okay, so then you want to look at the limit as n1 goes to infinity and n2 goes to infinity. But for that, you write the Liouville equation. And there are no surprises there. So here is the Liouville equation. So it's 1f, 1 probability density. So if you have a transport for that f, here we just v dot gradient x of f, here w dot gradient y of f. It's zero in the interior of the phase space. And on the boundary, when they collide, you, you have that pre-collisional is the same as post-collisional, okay? So uh, we would want, then we want to study this uh, uh, real world equation and look at the limit. Let me tell you what, in what I mean, so that I have, what was the issue and how we dealt with that issue, okay? In order to understand statistical behavior of such part of the system, uh, what do we require in, in terms of symmetry? So this is to note that many of these large limit, mean field limits and large limits, either in the quantum or classical context, you start with a system where you have a symmetry with respect, original system, it has symmetry, for example, with the bosons or all the particles are identical, so you have a symmetry. Now we have a situation that we don't have full symmetry of the system because we have particles A that behave in a certain way and particles B that we have behave in a different way. So we cannot just, we have to be very careful, the whole system is not symmetric. Okay. However, what we do know is that F is invariant under permutations of XIVI variables. That's one observation. And the other one is that F is also invariant under permutations of YJs, WJs. Okay. We do not require that F is invariant under interchanging XIVIs and XJVJs. Okay. So really want to stick to the physics that's in front of us. But then tools that people used to study these symmetric systems are based on the symmetry. So because working with a symmetric system, you can integrate out a certain number of variables and you introduce a marginal and you can work with it. So now we cannot quite do that because we cannot mix oranges and apples, okay? So what do we do? So what we do is we introduce a concept of a mixed marginal, okay? So this is this F, which has upper indexes N1 and N2 is number of particles of gas A, number of particles of gas B, S and L here are relevant. If there was no Y and W, then there is no L, and this is the formula for regular K part S particle marginal. What does that mean? Imagine there are no Ws and no Ys. So just X and V conveniently written next to each other, 
Okay, so then you integrate S plus first variable, you integrate all the way to and variables. So you're left with something that depends on the first S variables. And you can do that because you have a symmetry with respect to all these N1 variables. And of course, whatever you do, because you are really doing symmetry with respect to labeling of particles. So whatever you do to positions, you have to do the same stuff to velocities. Now we have two groups. So we are integrating out Ys and Ws using L. So it's not that L has to be the same. It's not that it should be diagonal. It's not that S is equal to L, but you're integrating out leftover from N1, from gas A up to the level S, and you're integrating out um, leftover from gas B using symmetry for the gas B for the level L. So we call this mixed marginal, and we can generalize this when you have K. It doesn't have to be two different gases. So then there is a program that one can consider you obtain a system equation satisfied for that. So that's BBGKY hierarchy. Then you look at the limit of that hierarchy and you obtain infinite hierarchy, and then you obtain the system. And that's what we do. I think I'll conclude yeah, just one or two slides. So the theorem is that uh, uh, for the system that obtains Boltzmann, that satisfies Boltzmann graph scaling, on a certain L infinity type spaces, the following equations are locally well posed in the uh, BBGKY hierarchy for our mixed marginals, Boltzmann hierarchy, which is this infinite hierarchy, and the Boltzmann system of mixtures. Additionally, we prove convergence of the solutions of one to solutions of two. So here for the initial data on the phase space, there is a big, big type of convergence, convergence of, of, of in observables, such as solutions of BBGKY, converge to solutions of the Boltzmann hierarchy. Now you might ask, okay, but how is this related to this original system that I wrote down for G and H, okay? So that's propagation of chaos for this uh, system. So we prove as a corollary that if G and H solve the original Boltzmann system that I wrote on the slide, so I can, I should, I should have used go back, I didn't do that. So let me show you for one, this is 4.1. Boltzmann for G, Boltzmann for H with these two possibilities of AA gas, AB, and then BB, BA. Okay, so what we show is this color, it's really propagation of chaos. So when solutions of the BBGKY with the uh, uh, with initial data, so this is on the phase space, we are talking about initial data which is factorized, factorization with respect to G, factorization with respect to H. So this solution of the BBGKY, they converge in the limit to, in sense of observables, to solutions that is uh, the tensor product of the S copies of G, L copies of H, where G and H solve the system, Boltzmann system that I started with. In other words, this is derivation of the, what people consider derivation of the Boltzmann system, okay? Uh, I will finish just by, concluding some, saying something about constants that, that tells us that this, is, uh, this makes sense, is that there are these mixed constants. If you remember, C12 is a constant which appears between AB interaction, and C21 is a constant in the equation for G, for a, uh, the other equation, H, that talks about interaction between gas B and gas A. Okay, so what's interesting to observe that we can do that with C's looking as follows, which means that as B grows large, C12 is big, but then C here, there is reciprocal of B, C21 is small. So in other words, if it, it agrees with physical intuition that if you have a situation where gas is comprised of large particles of one type and uh, small particles of the other, that then at the end, what will happen in the system, there will be dominate, one of them will dominate the one with the, because these C's, you, you can do it such that you obtain that really the, if this one is small, then this one is big. In other words, if you have, big massive, if you have big uh, uh, hard spheres, then that's going to be more relevant in the end system than the situation where you have little ones. So I, I think with that, I will stop. Thank you for your attention. Are there questions or comments? Yes, sure. Questions, um, possibly naive ones. Um, uh, is 
is there a, um, a nice way to see that, uh, oh, so, so for these ternary interactions, um, the scalings like uh, D minus a half instead uh -huh, of D minus uh -huh, one, uh -huh. um, is there an easy way to see why that's the right? Uh, yes, that's an excellent question. I can, I can show you. So that there's, um, there's actually some lifting of dimension that's happening there. So I'm, I'm going to address that. Okay. This is a good question. We noticed it, I must admit, algebraically first, okay? And then because that's like when you look at the BBGKY and then you look at the limit as number of particles goes tether only. You look at the C situation where number of particles goes to infinity, epsilon goes to zero, certain term disappears, everything, it disappears under certain formula. And we did it. And then we stopped and said, why? Okay, so, um, so what is the ternary interaction? D, I, comma, J, K. Okay, and let's write the square here. So this is xi minus xj squared plus xi minus xk squared, okay? So instead of looking, so we, we uh, to, to justify this uh, uh, scaling, what we can do, we can form a vector. So here, this is really, I can think about this as a distance, not in Rd, but distance in R2D between the following two vectors. I put here xi, xi, and the other one is xj, xk, okay? So if this is in Rd, so then I'm forming a vector which is actually in R2D. So then this is decoding the, the square of the distance between this vector, xi, xi, and xj, xk, because then you would have a difference, am I right? Absolute value of xi minus xj squared, and then the xi minus xk squared. So it's relevant to look at the distance between these two vectors in higher dimension. Instead of Rd, I'm climbing to R2D. How many possibilities do I have for that? So here we have, uh, uh, so here we have for these guys, I have n particles, am I right? And for these, I have n options like n minus one, but doesn't matter when I look at the order, it's like n squared. And then I look at the epsilon, so I'm looking at the uh, a, a, a volume in the, in the 2D dimension, so I'm picking up epsilon to the 2D minus one because epsilon is the relevant uh, diameter. So then this should be of order one. And when I do the cancellation, this is the same as saying n. So I, if I do the square root, this is the same as, uh, here it is, epsilon to the d minus one half times n is of order one. Okay, so in other words, one can think of this, what you're finding, Trevor, is really interesting, but this is something that's helping us study the binary ternary equation, not the derivation, but various things like moments and various things. This lifting of the dimension is something that helps us study the binary ternary equation. So it's in some sense going from problem in Rd to almost problem in R2D naturally. And also, if you remember also our impact directions, now we have two impact directions, omega one, omega two, as opposed to just situation when there is omega one and there's only one entry in the spectrum. Other questions, comments? What about quarterly, quarterly uh, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, so is, there, is there any intuition uh, you we, get from going uh, from We from are actually working on that with Joachim and with Billy Warner, my current student. We, are, we think it, it should be completely doable in the case of the hard sphere kind of interactions. Uh, we, are very gen we want to generalize what we did for the binary ternary. Mm -hmm. There are certain steps where it's not, uh, it's not automatic because we have to, everything has with these derivations, like you can, you can hope that you will get something, but you really have to do calculations for every single step. And there are, at some point we did like we expected some difficulties. So I remember that we did the calculation to see what, what is awaiting for us. And we are very hopeful that we will be able to handle that. It will require a lot of work. So there are long papers and a lot of checking. So now with Joachim and with Billy, we are doing that. We have just started that. So we will, we will see what happens. Yeah, I can certainly imagine it would take an awful lot of work. Okay. Um, but is there some goal at the end that you might be able to realize that you can, um, instead of, uh, at, at the beginning for Boltzmann, it was, okay, binary, everything else is an error. Mm -hmm. um, and now you're continuing to go mm -hmm. beyond that. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope that there might be a sort of an ultimate uh, putting together so that, so that the errors can be guaranteed always to be 
um, completely negligible. So, so it's like in the bind, like a, what? Uh, so, in terms of the work, what I think is because it will be, we are looking at the sum m going from two to k. Mm -hmm. So, some of these things will be recursive. So, it, it will be a work, but somehow we hope to write it recursively. So, we hope it's doable. Mm -hmm. That's one comment. The other thing why we are making our life harder <laughs> yes. is because we, we want to work on symmetrized immediately because uh -huh. it will be easier to, just to do asymmetric in terms of calculations. Yes. But we actually want to symmetrize everything. So, these permutations will be happening at all levels. So, we're carrying that. Um, uh, and then you can, um, so you are saying somehow, we haven't talked about so once, but what you're saying, Susan, perhaps if I understand correctly, imagine that we do, because when we do these higher order interactions, there's this sequence of epsilon. So we now did it for just two, epsilon two. And there is epsilon two, which is much smaller than epsilon three. And then we're here all the way to epsilon m. Am I right? Yes. So somehow, um, maybe by putting some coefficients, I haven't thought about that, but maybe by putting some coefficients, mm -hmm. one can turn off those coefficients mm -hmm. and obtain not all of them, but some of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think, but what, what, I'm, what I'm hopeful is that really major difficulties we face once we figured out how to do this, uh, it's really like doing some sort of thing, the curve. Mm -hmm. Every step yes. has to be rethought mm -hmm. in a recursive mm -hmm. fashion and hope that going from I to I plus one will be done by, will be guided by what happened yes. from one to two to three, but it has to be done. On the other hand, for Katz wow. model, which is stochastic process, we, we were able to do it. And it's not, Okay, but this is homogeneous Boltzmann equation. It's easier to notice things there. Interesting indeed. So, any more comments? Then let's thank Natasha again. I'm very glad we did the course.